Hello and good morning, and welcome to the Atheist Community of Austin's Talk Heathen Service. Please take out your perfectly inerrant holy book of vague ancient poetry and turn it to chapter 66, verse 9, and prepare to chant the list of things we all commit to before singing repeatedly about the perfection of our flawless leader and teacher who we all definitely agree on and honor with our shared rituals before contributing your spiritually mandated donation. Do you hear how ridiculous that sounds when speaking to a group of atheists? We don't have a shared creed. We don't have a holy book or holy men or holidays. No agreed upon canon. And we don't have a list of prescribed rituals or obligations. As my friend and mentor, Dr. Del Rey wrote, some claim that atheism is a religion, but that poses a problem of what you call people who do not believe in Zeus or Thor or Allah or even the flying spaghetti monster. Atheism simply sees no evidence of any God. Or as Clark Adams said, if atheism is a religion, then health is a disease. Not convinced? Well, let's get into it. Give us a call at 512-991-9242, because the show is coming right now. All right, well, welcome everyone. Today is March 31st, 2024. I am your host, Christy Powell, and joining me today is Richard Jolliver. Hello, I'm very excited about this. It is Easter Sunday, so I'm hoping we get some great Christian calls in. Uh, but of course, if you are of any religion, you are more than welcome to call, and we will have some good, friendly conversations with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to get into it. It's become something of a low-key tradition for me to do one of these shows on Easter. I don't know if God is going to charge me overtime for all of those sins when I get to the accounting, but I am hoping that we can have some meaningful conversations today and really get into why all of this matters, why we would bother doing all of this volunteer work, why we would bother trying to convince people about these ideas. Newsflash, it's not because we're trying to convert anybody to our religion. Rather, it's because we're looking to be free of everybody else's. I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's one of my pet hates when people call atheism a religion. Uh, you know, where are the, I was going to say where are the tenants, but where are the tenants of Christianity? Because everyone seems to disagree who's Christian anyway. So I'm not quite sure no, where I their mean, tenants are. <laughs> in my church, we chanted all of the tenants and all of the things that we agreed. And anybody who did not chant was not actually Christian which was uh, you know, really problematic when I would go to Christian schools or other Christian churches and see people who had different beliefs. But you know, even in that giant tome of a Bible that we were expected to memorize, there wasn't like a great clear plan on what we ought to be doing. So hopefully some folks can provide us with a little clarity today. Yeah, very much. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Well, we are here for Talk Heathen, which is a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of atheism, critical thinking, secular humanism, and the separation of religion and government. Talk Heathen is a live call in show, and we have open lines. So get your calls in. We're at 512. 512- 9919242 or you can reach us through your computer at tiny.cc/callth and while those calls are loading up we're excited to hear from you but first we are going to go over last week's talk heathen to me segment last week we asked you to complete the sentence it was pretty fucked up when god blank here are our top 3 answers uh michael kramer 6246 said it was fucked up when God was okay with Lot's daughter doing what they did, but punished Noah's son. Yeah, if you are not up on your Bible trivia, uh, that is one that they usually don't ask you or give you like brownie points for memorizing, but it's worth looking into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Noah's, Noah's son and uh, Lot's daughter, I think uh, both got a pretty raw raw end of the deal on things but look this is this is a bible so so it doesn't really matter as long as god's good with it uh, it's all good 
Yeah, if you stopped reading your Bible after Sunday school ended uh, and never got into that part of the book, it might, you know, change some of your thoughts. Uh, our number two favorite answer came from X Million 1704 said, it was fucked up when God hardened Pharaoh's heart to justify his desire to kill kids. The whole Pharaoh <laughs> heart hardening free will thing has always been something of a struggle for me. There's a lot of maybe theology to play with there. But uh, yeah, I think we can at least agree pretty fucked up. Yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite things. As soon as a Christian tells us we've got free will, and especially those who, and I've come across many of them, who say God wouldn't in fact, infringe upon that free will and point them to their own book, which clearly shows us an example of where he does. Pharaoh wanted to let the people go. He was quite happy yeah. to let the people go. And God said, mm -mm -mm -mm, not on my watch. I haven't killed enough people yet to show my might and power. So I'm hardening your heart and you will refuse to let them go. Yeah, that's pretty fucked up. Yeah, so we believe be through faith, and faith comes from hearing the Word of God, and so we read the Word of God, but the Word of God disagrees with the Word of God. If only someone would make a list, a creed maybe, that we could all chant. I, I'm really pushing for this idea today. <laughs> all right, and our favorite answer this past week came from Simon Pritchardson, 7301, who said, it was fucked up when God came upon everybody. That was a hot, sticky mess. You know, as kind of like the ACA sex guy, I'm I'm just going to leave that there and everybody else can enjoy their Easter morning visuals however they choose to. That, that was one person who knew Christy Powell was going to be hosting this week. <laughs> <laughs> well, our prompt for uh, this next week is why didn't God ban slavery? You know, maybe if we get enough answers from this question, Richard, you and I could take a week or two off because it does seem like one of those just kind of perennial things that we all sort of like to ignore. God actually had some, I'm not going to say pretty good advice, but he had some advice on how to treat your enslaved peoples. That's uh, that's pretty gross. What uh, What's your answer, Richard? I mean, why didn't God get around or bother to ban slavery? I think uh, for me, it's, it's a pretty simple one. It's like uh, everything else that seems to be immoral in the Bible. It suited God at the time. God, God's quite yeah. happy to let things like slavery and rape and uh, taking virgin girls as spoils of war. Uh, is, they're all things that are good with God as long as God's commanded them. Uh, anybody else does it? Mm, not good. Not good. Uh, <laughs> because we have objective morality unless it's God, and then yeah, right. things change a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, uh, we've we already got uh, some callers on the line. I'd love to invite more to come in. Before we jump onto the phones, I want to take a quick moment to thank our incredible crew, all of the folks that make this show happen. I'd love to thank our, uh, our the audio folks, the moderators, the notes, the stamps, the call screeners, all of these wonderful people, many of whom are not depicted here. It takes a huge team to make all of this happen. And I absolutely want to say thank you to everybody for making Richard and I look so good, who when we just get to show up and do the show with your calls. So join us in the easy part, if you will. Uh, but let's start off by talking to uh, Miguel in England. Uh, Miguel, what you got for us today? Yes. Basically, I want to talk uh, about uh, Spinoza's God. Because, okay, walk us through it. Uh, I'm different, you know. I'm, I, 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 th I think, um, I think God is uh, Spinoza's God, and uh, I'm not religious, like Spinoza. Spinoza wasn't religious. Yeah, can you can you define your terms a little bit? I, I think that Richard and I are largely familiar with the broad concept that you're describing, but I'd love to hear how you understand it. I'd love for our audience to be able to catch up. You believe in, quote, Spinoza's God. What is it that you believe? Why do you believe it? Well, I think uh, I don't agree with the word uh, belief because uh, Spinoza was a philosopher mm -hmm. like me. You know, and... Uh, he came up, uh, we came up, I didn't read Spinoza, and we came up uh, thinking rationally that God is everything that exists, past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. 
But that, that, that's not uh, that's not like saying uh, God is the universe. You understand? Uh, Spinoza didn't write a book to explain God is the universe and the universe is God. Therefore, uh, God is like atheism. You understand? Spinoza's God is like my God. God okay, is- well, tell, tell us about your God. Uh, you've said that God is everything, but not the universe. Help me understand what that really means. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is uh, God is everything, but the universe was created by God. You understand? That's the difference. There is an intelligence behind uh, the creation. There is an intelligence be- behind the reality. You understand? It's a... Uh, Literally, you know, my concept of God is just literally. God is everything. You name it. Everything that exists. You, me, everything that exists. However, it's not the universe in the sense that the, what I'm saying is uh, Spinoza's God has been uh, defamed, you know, has been uh, put down as atheism. But uh, Spinoza's God is not that. Uh, for, I'm, for I'm still a little unclear on what Spinoza's God is. I mean, whether we reference Spinoza or whether we reference pantheism or, or any of these different ideas, if God is Isn't everything, then what distinguishes God from nothing? I mean, uh, God, for Spinoza and for me, is everything. And the universe, the universe was created, was designed by God, you understand? Basically, God created itself. God okay. is uncaused. cause. God, God created itself. God created itself from, from, from self. Yeah, I mean, I, I can work with that notion. Uh, from a certain point of view, I am creating myself at this very moment. Uh, I may not be intelligently, consciously directing that process, but I'm consuming resources. The cells within my body are converting those resources. I'm growing more hair. I'm growing a bigger belly. Like this notion of God being his own creation Fine, I'm I'm willing to play around in that ballpark with you. I I just don't understand but, uh, what it means that God is everything. If you're saying that this table and this microphone and my glasses and me are all God, then what is the difference between me just saying this table and this microphone and my glasses are a table and microphone and glasses? How does adding the word God to those uh, items change anything for anybody? Uh, changes absolutely everything. Abso- absolutely hey, everything. Please, yeah, tell me about because, it. Because, 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 uh, according according to atheist, uh, when uh, Spinoza's God means nothing, in the sense that that when you die, you know that's the end. You know that's atheism in a sense. You know uh, there is no life after death because there is not an intelligence that created the universe. I mean, I don't know that I can co-sign that as the atheist belief, but sure, we can go along with that. Again, though, I'm still trying to figure out what the difference is between this microphone with God and this microphone without God. If you want to say that that when this microphone microphone is crushed into bits and thrown into a landfill and then the microplastics get into the ocean or whatever, that it's no longer a microphone, it's it's died its microphone-ness, but it still exists as matter in a material world, okay, that makes sense to me. I'm still trying to figure out why the word God has anything to do with anything or what any of that has to do with with I guess eternal life. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an analogy. I'm gonna explain it with an analogy. You are gonna understand this. Thing, okay, an okay. analogy of life. You know, for for an atheist, you know, the the brain is is kind of the television set. You know, and the and the mind is the is the image of the television set. You know, we are living, we are uh, creating our own image on the television set. We are. Uh, um, and basically, for an atheist, you know, when the television set, when the when the brain dies, the mm-hmm. image is destroyed and uh, everything ends. You know, there is no afterlife. 
the difference with God is that the television set and the image, yourself and everything else, has been created by a superior entity. What does it mean that the universe was created with a purpose? You understand? Something, I'm not saying he, you know, do you understand? I'm not saying something, for me, is time. I, I, I suppose I still don't. Self. If if I'm playing along with the way that you're speaking about it, and I'm imagining consciousness as a television set that I watch, I I think that there is some value to that notion. And, you know, we can talk about consciousness and, you know, the dualism and, and all of these sort of concepts of how we experience the world. But I recognize that that TV, the, the broadcast signal, is a collection of all of these sensory inputs, all of these nerves that are all wiring together and producing a, a signal, if we want. And when I die, that signal will go off in a certain sense, but also all of the things that created that signal, all of the nerves, all of the neurochemicals, my brain, my physical body, all of these things will break down and be reconstituted into other things. How is that any different from the afterlife that you're describing? And again, how, how do I see God in this? God is basically the creator of the universe. You know? well, this is the, this, the, 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 the million, do, uh, million dollar uh, question is, uh, have we been created? Because if we have been created, we can expect, you know, rationally uh, eternity, you know, because uh, yes, the look, universe was created for a per with a purpose. Okay, and, that, that's uh, a, a pretty big claim right there. I think that we can park ourselves right there. How do you know that the universe was created by a god that is also that universe? Or not that universe, but all of the things in it. Basically, for Spinoza, the thing is, uh, Spinoza and myself, we agree. And I, I, I didn't read the Spinoza. This is this is the point. Why don't you tell me what you believe, uh, regardless for... of whether it agrees or disagrees with anybody else? Can you just tell me how you know that there is a intelligent creator God? Because I'm going to explain it simple. From reality. Uh, from reality comes is created reality. That's a sequence. You understand? Reality creates reality. That's a sequence. And the sequence must have a first reality. That first reality is God, the reality that created the rest of reality. And, 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 and God created the reality from self because from nothing you cannot create anything. And basically what I'm, what I'm saying is Atheists are uh, disrespecting the memory of Spinoza because Spinoza wasn't an atheist. I'm, I'm not particularly Spinoza interested in what person. atheists allegedly said about Spinoza. I'm interested in having a conversation where I try to understand what you're saying. And when I boil that down a little bit, I seem to get to this notion that logically nothing can come from nothing or something cannot come from nothing. And therefore, there must be a God. Uh, Richard, I'd, I'd love for you to jump in here because it, it seems like uh, he has explained this to me very simply quite a number of times, and I'm still not quite getting it. Is there more to it than what I've maybe suggested I, here? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on a couple of things. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like, like you, Christy, I'd like to, I'm not particularly interested in Spinoza's view. I'm interested in the caller's view. Uh, because that's who we're talking to. I don't think your view, Miguel, and Spinoza's are exactly the same anyway, because God, uh, according to Spinoza, was the substance comprising the universe. Uh, it wasn't separate from it. Uh, and that seems to be a difference between you and Spinoza. But let us I'm, I'm quite happy to leave Spinoza out of it, because we are talking oh. to you. Uh, and... Uh, you know, as as much as I, th I do agree with you on one thing, actually, which I think, uh, you know, we spoke last week and we disagreed quite heavily. So I'm going to put this out there just for the sake of, uh, you know, building bridges, <laughs> as it were. The Spinoza, uh, you know, there are a lot of atheists out there who do uh, think that Spinoza's God, what they, that Spinoza didn't believe in a God at all, that it was just kind of this... Uh, use of language 
uh, and and not in fact an actual deity. And I agree with you that that is wrong. It, it was a kind of a pantheistic god that he believed in, but he did believe in God. It was just it, it, the the reason he was so different to the other philosophers at the time and such so, such a I mean he started a huge movement with his views because he was one of the first to really rebel against this Christian uh, triune god and and it got him into lots of trouble doing so but he, uh, he yeah he, he did believe in a god and uh, you know I think we, we must acknowledge that uh, too many people I think use him as as kind of using God as a metaphor for something that it wasn't a God, and that's just not the case at all. But Spinoza aside, let's talk about your views on it. Uh, uh, the thing, the thing I'm kind of stuck on. I'm stuck on two things. One is how do we get to God created Himself if God is kind of one with the universe, and the second one is, uh, you know, how do we how do we make the distinction between the universe and God. Because last week when we spoke, we spoke about the singularity at the beginning of the universe. And I'm quite happy to say that the singularity is a necessary being that caused the universe for the sake of argument. How do we distinguish that natural process between a conscious God? Because there seems to be nothing in any scientific literature that presents the singularity that way and presents a universe that way as being any form of intelligence. And and that's the bit I'm very interested in your opinion on. All right, okay. <clears throat> I would like you just to ask you one question because this is the key question. You know, I, atheists don't understand. Uh, if, if you could choose, if you could choose, you know, how is reality, okay? Would you, would you rather the universe was created by an intelligence, or would you rather the universe was created by a singularity without uh, an intelligence? This is the key question, you know, because because it is better for you. It is better for you if if um, if the universe was created by an intelligence. You understand? Why, why does it matter what, what we think. would rather, though? <laughs> like, why does it matter what I wish? was true. Do I wish that there was an all-powerful, all-loving God? Part of me, yeah. If he's truly all-loving, like, yeah, I do kind of wish that. But my wishing hasn't made it so. Billions of people all over the earth for thousands of years wishing doesn't make it so. So what does it really matter ultimately if I wish that there was a loving creator God? Because well, I'm not talking about a loving creator God. I'm talking about but any God. any God at all. Like why why does it matter yeah, that yeah. I wish that there was intelligent design? That I wish that there was a God. What does my wishing because... have to do with it? I wish that I had a million dollars parked in savings, and I do not. So I don't really know why it would matter whether I would prefer it. It doesn't change reality. Because. Yeah, I know it doesn't change reality, but it changes the way you think about reality. If you think God is a good thing for you, then you may search for God, you understand? Because uh, the problem with atheists is that they don't search for God. Why they don't search for God? Because they think that it doesn't exist, you understand? What's the point of, of, of searching for something you think it doesn't exist? And on top of that, you don't, you don't want it, you understand? Why would you? I mean, you're, you're telling me a lot about what I do and do not want, what I do and do not believe, and, and these things, what I am and am not willing to do. And I will tell you, I have searched for God. I have searched for God. I have read the Bible more times than most people I know who do believe in a God, but none of that really matters ultimately. There either is a God or there isn't. And I don't really see how what I would rather has to do with anything. And perhaps you didn't mean to use that word. Perhaps we've gotten distracted by just a, a piece of your argument. But I'm still trying to figure out what your argument is. And I, I would love for you to maybe take a, a final moment to sort of summarize for us yeah. what it is oh, that okay. you believe in. And most importantly, why you believe it. The thing is, I'm not a believer, you know, I'm not religious. The thing is, I'm a philosopher. I'm a philosopher, you okay. know, and... Uh, You're a philosopher logical, who believes in God. 
No, I'm a philosopher that comes to the conclusion that the universe cannot be eternal and, the, and reality is eternal. This is not a faith. This, this, this is philosophy. This is logic. Did, you understand? Uh, all the arguments, absolutely all the theological arguments, the fine-tuning, the morality argument, absolutely all the arguments indicate that I am right. And also the Spinoza was right, that the universe, uh, I mean, that God is absolutely everything, but with the difference that the universe was created, that's the difference, you know, with, by, by intelligence. Uh, th but that's, that's not, not like Spinoza's say, God, Miguel. Belief. Again, Miguel, that's not Spinoza's God. That isn't Spinoza's God. The fine-tuning argument has no relevance to Spinoza's God, because Spinoza's God was the universe. He didn't yes, set the universe it, into motion the universe and then walk it. off. Uh, please don't, so please don't tell me again it, what it. the atheists believe. You know, it's you've called three, I think it's three weeks in a row now, and each week you've told us what atheists believe. You're talking to two. Ask us. It's it's really, really simple. You could just ask us what we believe. Well, uh, uh, Turns out we don't have a codified creed of beliefs that we all hold to. We actually only have one thing philosophically in common, which is that we don't see evidence of a God. You suggest that you do see evidence of a God. We've spent a good 20-ish minutes trying to sort through what that evidence is. I'm not very clear on it, but I, I'd love to give you the final word before we jump onto another call. Um, I just want to say that uh, I enjoyed the conversation and I gave my everything. Uh, it's all I can do. I uh, try to persuade people that uh, that uh, death is not the end. It's simply it's, it's simply that you know death is not the end because the universe was created, and then we have a purpose. Uh, there is uh, the universe. Uh, is conscious existence. Anyway, this is my, my final I appreciate point. you yeah. you boiling it down in that way. Uh, and I would invite you to kind of ask yourself that question of how do you know those things and to maybe check back with us after a, a month or so. Thank you so much. I enjoyed the call as well. All right, appreciate thank you. Thank you. you. Have a great weekend. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Richard, how does that notion of uh, a mind watching a television set, does that line up with sort of your conceptualization of consciousness? No, not all. We, uh, uh, I, have a, I, I have an interest in consciousness from uh, both a philosophical point of view, which is, which is my area of study, and a kind of a neurological point point of view which isn't my area of study but it is one i'm really really interested in and uh it, it's i love that I, lo I love talking about neurology and i love the idea of consciousness but mm -hmm. i don't see consciousness as this kind of disembodied thing which created the universe you know all all the theories of consciousness that we have um the the the, the good main theories of consciousness that we sure. have at the moment are based in kind of the brain and the nervous system. Now, don't get me wrong, they disagree with each other. And there's there's lots of ground that we need to go through. There's lots of unknowns. But they are all, con in one way or another, based in the brain or nervous system. And I think that's really interesting that all the leading scientists in this field, even when they disagree with each other, and some of them quite strongly disagree with each sure. other, even when they disagree with each other, they all kind of have the consensus amongst all of them, regardless of their little pet theories, is that it is based in the brain, in consciousness in some way. Now, there are, there, there are variants on that. Some people think that they're emotion-based, that consciousness is an emotion-based thing. Some people think it's a purely kind of, it's purely a, just a, an abstract concept that comes from the brain. Some people think that it's part of uh, evolution. It's come about as part of evolution and it's, it's a mixture of emotion and circumstance and all these other things, but they all agree. All of them agree that it comes in some way from some, and I don't like this term, but it's the easiest term to use, from physicalism. 
Sure. Yeah. And, and uh, even, I mean, there are even kind of, uh, there's, there's even an idea the 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 brain the consciousness goes beyond the brain and in it certainly i appreciate with... you involving the nervous system in in that kind of brief summary because i do think that that's an important component uh that the the brain doesn't function as a singular piece that, yeah. that really all of our body is working in conjunction with itself yeah it's 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 a it's a brilliant brilliant field of study at and i highly and hugely encourage everybody to go out. There's lots of good uh, papers. There's lots of good books on the subject as well. Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, go out and, and just do a, just have a little bit of reading on the subject and, like, get into the basics. It's really, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is your – what do you think on the subject? Because you're you're the kind of professional of the two of us in this field. For sure. No, I uh, I could honestly talk about consciousness all day. And I know that, you know, two white guys sitting here in front of microphones on YouTube going on and on about consciousness is maybe a little bit exhausting. But I can easily get sucked into these ideas. I appreciate how valuable it is to have this understanding that we are not like a disembodied soul inside of some sort of mecha suit that the reality is that our brain our nervous system our body all of these things are working in conjunction and consciousness is this emergent property of a sufficient number of neurons all kind of firing together and wiring together in these really fascinating ways i think that there's a lot to be said about taking time to meditate or whatever else to just recognize that reality and to understand how easy it is to get sucked into this notion that we're somehow like driving a mech suit when we are in fact that mech suit like the me is my body and my mind and everything else and you know <laughs> kind of like miguel maybe suggested that idea will really change the way you see the world i uh, i could definitely go deeper into it but we've actually got a call from lease in canada who i think may want to perhaps touch on some similar notions uh let's see where you'd like to take it uh lease what's on your mind today oh <clears throat> hi can you hear me okay yeah absolutely uh tell us what your what's on your mind okay well i'm an atheist and um one thing I have noticed amongst other atheists and agnostics as well is that, you know, they they have no problem kind of criticizing the Abrahamic religion, so Islam, Judaism, Christianity, but they kind of romanticize like East Asian religions like Taoism or Buddhism. And I was wondering, like, why do you why do you think that is like? Mm. Because I think, like, if you're going to criticize an ID, like, I don't think you should just pick and choose which ideologies to, you know, critically analyze. Challenge, yeah. You know? No, I, 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 I hear that. To, I sorry, love before this. Christy, sorry, before Christy sure. starts, I just want to say that you have you have chosen the perfect show uh, to call and ask this question on because of all the ACA hosts, I think both myself and Christy are probably of everyone that I know of the most familiar with Buddhism. So <laughs> you, you, you've picked really, really good hosts to call this on, but uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, Kevin no, not at all. I, I was actually going to say more <laughs> or less the same thing that uh, I am a religious trauma therapist and I help a lot of people particularly deal with trauma that occurred because of their engagement with uh, the Abrahamic religions and a lot of the philosophy, a lot of the field of study that I apply in that setting does come from what we might call Buddhist psychology and has at least culturally its roots in a lot of these notions. So I think this is a super important question. And I just want to start off right at the top and say, I don't think that there ought to be a difference in the uh, the critical thinking that we apply here. I don't think that there is value in giving a pass to one particular thought process or anything else that we want to uh, support critical thinking in all of our endeavors. So that's where I'd maybe like to set the table just so we're all on the same page. Uh, but Richard, is there anything that you'd like to sort of respond to in that that maybe accusation that uh, that atheists are less critical here? Or perhaps yeah, less critical I, than they ought to be. 
I, I think I think it's very interesting because I actually I I both agree and disagree with you on this. I think largely I have noticed the same thing. I've noticed lots of atheists being uh, very uh, friendly, shall we say, towards a lot of Eastern religions and uh, not criticising them as much as they possibly could with be. And I think that's largely due down to a, a misunderstanding on the atheists, on a lot of atheists' point of view, because a lot of, the, a lot of them have only come across kind of Western secular forms of these religions. Uh, and mm, that's not mm -hmm. particularly a fault of, of the atheists. It's what they've come across. And when you're speaking on something, you speak from your own knowledge and your own background. But I do agree it is something that happens... I, however, I'm not one of those people, and I do speak out, uh, especially against Buddhism. I've been practicing Buddhism, Buddhist meditation for well over 20 years. I've been studying the Buddhist scriptures academically for well over 10 years, and I, you know, I do speak out against uh, uh, Buddhism uh, and Buddhist practices of things. Uh, things I did a video recently on a on a different network who I shan't advertise. Um, but I uh, I did a video of top 10 misconceptions about Buddhism mm. uh, and, you know, and touched on lots of stuff in there, including the fact that there are lots of supernatural elements. Mm -hmm. There are heavens and hells. There are supernatural beings. There are supernatural powers within Buddhism. The, the way women are treated in Buddhism is not brilliant. Uh, so I, I do criticize Buddhism quite a lot. I don't get chance to do it a lot. And I think this is the key point. And I think this is the, probably the key response to your question is that we just don't get the opportunity to do it very often. You know, on, mm. on TikTok, quite a lot, I see Christians coming out and saying, why do people only criticize Christianity? They don't. But the spheres that we kind of move in, the circles we move in, uh, you know, social media very much kind of is largely Christians and atheists talking to each other. So you get this is why you do, you get a lot of kind of focus towards Christianity. Just look at this show. The majority of callers are Christians. Most of we... the focus is put on Christianity, not because we don't have have uh, the ability or the one or the uh, focus to crit criticize other religions is simply because we don't get those people calling in. And, you know, if we did, we could have those conversations. And I hugely encourage Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus to call into the show. Uh, and I'd love to have more of those conversations uh, because, you know, I'm, this is, I love this stuff. This is my area, this uh, religious studies which is what I do is not just about talking to Christians. And I, I was quite a latecomer towards kind of, if you like, criticizing air quotes, Christianity, because simply because I, I was focused for a lot of my early study career on Buddhism and uh, Islam. So I, I didn't really come to Christianity and looking into that until about five years ago. So it's it's very kind of the, the Christianity to me is new. So it's really funny when I hear people saying, "Well, people don't criticize other religions because it's I kind of went the other way around. I did it backwards to to the kind of common thing that we see here, where we do we largely talk to Christians. But uh, yeah, I, I get the I get the criticism overall. It doesn't appear like we do. A lot of people who are atheists don't seem to, and I think that is largely because they have a skewed ver like idea of what uh, Buddhism and Taoism. We talked about Taoism a few weeks ago on the show. Uh, and I, funnily enough, that's another one where I got a lot of people who, who believe uh, in Taoism or believe in kind of this Western form of Taoism criticizing me for saying, well, actually, hang on a minute. Taoism does contain some supernatural elements. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not. And I got a lot of criticism from Western Taoists on that video for making those statements. Uh, so it is the, the thing with any religion. Look, this is this is my stick and it's always been the same. The thing with any religion is you don't have Christianity. You don't have Buddhism. You don't have Islam. You have Christianities or Buddhisms or Islams. And being a secular Buddhist is a legitimate form of Buddhism and not believing in any supernatural elements. But that doesn't mean that that is Buddhism. 
And that is what I think people have this misconception about. They, they mistake some a legitimate form of a religion as being that religion on the whole. And I think it's something that we could all do a lot better in in understanding the difference. But I've talked quite a lot, so I'm going to let you respond and then I'm going to let Christy talk to you for a while. Oh, okay. Thanks for that insight. Um, I also have a bachelor's in religious studies, so you and I have something in common. Um, also, <laughs> I wanted to say that you and I just spoke on TikTok earlier. <laughs> I'm out of clonazepam is my username. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for calling. Yeah. yeah anything else um, we can sort anyway, out for? Hmm? I, I think it's I think it's interesting that people don't, um, you know, when they think of Buddhism, when they think of Hinduism, they think of or even Taoism. They don't. They think of like creating balance in your life, which there is a part of that in those religions, of course. Um, I mostly studied like Abrahamic traditions, but I did study some Eastern traditions and, uh, I, I don't think people really understand how brutal the caste system is in Hinduism. And they say, sure. well, it was outcasted and they don't, we don't practice that anymore, but we, we know that they do. It's just sure. not official and, or widow burning, like the misogyny that's in um, a lot of different forms of Hinduism, the misogyny that's in the, the concept of the yin and the yang in Taoism. I think people, um, I don't think it's, I wouldn't say it's that, maybe not so much that they're lazy, but I, I think, I think that this is just my opinion, that because we live in the Western world where we're, the majority of the people are affected mostly by different kinds of Christianity, Judaism, and a bit of Islam. You know, that's what really is affecting us every day in society. So I think that because we don't have an extremely, how do I say this? Because we don't have like large populations um, that are kind of equal to the Christian population, I think we don't really get much of a chance to to have those discussions, I think, because mm. like, like, like even in Canada, like we have, you know, Good Friday is a stat holiday, but we don't have any stat holidays that are, um, that are like, you know, like the, the birthday of Buddha is not a stat holiday here. Right. Yeah. I mean, if we just look at the ACA and, and our little footprint, uh, there are no doubt more churches within a one mile walk of the Free Thought Library than there are uh, Buddhist temples in the entire county in which uh, we reside. Right now, we're seeing all of the Christians closing all of the shops for holidays, and that's not something we experience from Buddhism. And to Richard's point earlier, the Buddhism that we do tend to experience is this much more secularized, maybe run through a uh, like Western psychology laboratory version of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So when people actually do sit down and want to do like comparative religion, the way you're discussing religious studies, I think that we do start to see a lot more of that like textual criticism of Buddhism, but in the sort of everyday day to day life of many of the people watching this program, their only experience of Buddhism typically is going to have nothing to do with religious oppression. It's not going to have anything to do with these like outlandish metaphysical claims and is actually going to be in many ways additive to their lives if they are using what we might call like Buddhist research into meditation or some of these like cultural traditions. So None of that is to say that you get a free pass for believing in absolutely ridiculous ideas, particularly when those ideas do lead to demonstrable harm, as you highlighted in the caste system and all of these kinds of things. So I, I think ultimately we're largely on the same page here. Uh, anything that you might quibble with or, or want to push back on, Lise? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just really wanted to know what your opinion on that is, because I've I've criticized um Eastern traditions in like various different atheist groups, and they're like, "What? That that religion's not oppressive." And I'm like, "Are you joking? Like, well, 
I think people in North America and maybe parts of Europe as well, I think that when we think of Buddhism, we think of like mindfulness and meditation and we don't really learn like the different ins and outs of like Buddhists do believe in the transcendental. Look at Mahayana Buddhism. Like sure. it's pretty it's like it's um these these are not purely just philosophies. These are religions that involve the transcendental that are just as ridiculous as as Christian theology. Right. And so is there value in sort of separating out mindfulness, meditation practice, some of these concepts from the larger like Buddhist label? I absolutely believe that there is. Uh, And so when I discuss Buddhist psychology, I don't often use that terminology unless I have an opportunity to sit down and really explain to somebody that these are concepts that may be originated in some of these faith traditions that have then been rigorously tested and evaluated and that don't have uh, necessarily these same ties or don't obligate us to believe in some of these more irrational things. And I think that level of intentionality is sort of lacking in some of our word choice, just because we can't get irate about every problem on the planet just yet. And I think it makes sense that we would oftentimes be focused in other places. That doesn't mean that our ire is undeserving on other potential problems in the world. Right, right. Okay, well, thanks for the conversation. I really appreciate you um, entertaining my question. So, Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a fascinating idea. I thank you for highlighting this, and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. We appreciate your call so much. Yeah, you too. Have a good weekend. Take care. Okay, bye. I love that one. I think, uh, and, and, you know, I think like... Uh, like they said, and as I said, I think it's very important just to note this. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're personal. You know, I've got a very good friend at the ACA, no less, who is a secular Buddhist. Mm-hmm. So it's certainly not a criticism of people who don't accept the supernatural elements. It's just a, it's just a, a to put it out there that, it, you know, we can acknowledge that these religious faiths have these elements to them. And we don't have to take a one size fits all view to them. Yeah, no, I I definitely appreciate that as well. I I wish that our language was a little bit cleaner and tidier. Uh, I definitely like I've presented at religious trauma conferences where I've had to kind of take a moment and be like, well, okay, so <laughs> I'm going to talk a lot about Buddhism. Let's maybe meet, talk about what that actually means or what I mean by some of these ideas. And some of those notions of secular Buddhism and uh, all of that can get a little bit murky when we just don't have a culture that is uh, well-equipped to really understand and care about those differences. Yeah, yeah, very important. Uh, another thing that is important on this show mm. is uh, the fact that you can super chat us and we will read out your super chats if they are appropriate to do so. <laughs> we a disclaimer, we reserve the right not to read them. <laughs> um, just, just on the off chance that we do get anything on toward. Uh, but we, we do get some great super chats here. So I'm going to read a couple out. We've got Miranda Rensberger, uh, one of our members who sent $5 and says, in the word of Patty Smith, Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. Keep oh. your religious guilt and manipulation to yourself. Hey, uh, Absolutely, Miranda. Uh, we have Dark Wolfie Games, who sent $10 and says, and lo, there was Christy and Richard, and all was good across the lands. Thank you for what you do, and I hope you have an amazing show. I'm having an amazing show. How about you, Krista? So good so far. It's been a good time. We got a few uh, more calls in the queue and a few more opportunities. So if you've got a, a burning question, there's still time to hit us up. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. We have. Not to be outdone. Miranda Rensberger has sent another $10 and says, today is an important celebration, Trans Day of Visibility. As long as theists use their God as an excuse for bigotry, atheists need to fight that. Trans rights are human rights, absolutely. And whereas I said we we have the right not to read some super chats out, that is one I would like to push to the forefront on every time. (laughs) Fair to say. 
All right. Uh, well, let's learn a little bit more about why all of this matters and, uh, and talk to Kat in Indonesia. Uh, Kat, tell us what's on your mind today. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm Kat and I'm calling in from Indonesia and I guess I'm a bit of a known troll in the ACA uh, live stream chat. And actually that has something to do with the topic I'm calling in about today. And it's, um, I guess I'm calling in about whether it's even possible to move on mentally from childhood religious indoctrination. Sure. Um, I am a, I, I am an, I'm an atheist, right? But I used to be part of a major Abrahamic religion. And I'm sure you know which one. It's not Christianity, it's the other one. And, you know, I found myself that uh, each time I participate in discussion of ethics or discussion of morality, and just very recently, I was in this discussion about abortion rights. And, you know, even though I ha I know exactly what uh, I say, I know exactly what the right uh, conclusion is, but there is always that part of me, uh, that religious indoctrination remnant, that uh, tells me that, uh, making me feel that, hey, you're wrong. Are you really going to believe this? You know, it's all a lie. You know, it's all Western propaganda. You know, you've been lied to. It's just modern day brainwashing and stuff like that. And I guess like uh, for, for context, um, because of where I'm from, I, as a kid, I was, uh, me, basically every student had to go through a mandatory religious class from the first grade of elementary school all the way to the first semester of college. And the religion, it, it wasn't even a comparative religion class, no, it was a class where you get taught about the penance of the religion that you're born into, that is the religion that your parents identify on their ID. Right? So my parents had this fun religion, and so I... Uh, I was uh, put into that class, and it had the same, like, it was as essential as mathematics or science in that I had mm -hmm. no option to not take the class. Uh, and if I didn't take the class, I simply would not pass because the grade will be zero and I will not pass. I will not even pass sure. elementary school. No, I, yeah, I deeply that. relate. I, yeah. I grew up in a education system. My schooling involved a lot more hermeneutics and worship and uh, chapel time and everything else than it did uh, mathematics, than it did history, than it did science. So I definitely appreciate those past experiences and how difficult it is to move on from them. I suppose I am a little bit curious or, or maybe can, uh, not clear on what your ultimate question here. Does it really come down to, is it possible to heal? Is it possible to move on? Or, or did you have something else in mind? Yeah, that's exactly my question. Is it possible to move on from that? It's like I said, I still have that part of me that uh, is begging me to be that religious person back, uh, you know, sure. always there. It's, yeah. And yeah. I fear, like, I fear that it's getting really hopeless. Like, sometimes I fear, like, it's going to be exactly like the language learning. And as much as I immerse myself in my second language, English, I cannot forget uh, my first time, my first language, Indonesian, because it's just been ingrained in my head since I was a kid. Oh. And yeah, I guess I just called in to get some reassurance or maybe like you guys have some tips to how I can move on because when it comes to communities, uh, skeptical communities and so on, we don't really have a lot of this. In fact, we don't have any where I live. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely hear you. And I think I want to absolutely stress that change is not only possible, it's inevitable. Change is already happening. Your views, your beliefs, your values, your thoughts, your emotions, those are going to be different every single moment of every day. And even if there are consistencies, there's always going to be a what we might call an evolution. That's not necessarily an evolution in a good direction or a bad direction. It's just true that things are going to change. So ultimately, it becomes about your choices and your responsibilities here. Is it possible for you to change? You are already changing. If you would like to change in a particular direction, that's going to come through effort. That's going to come through choices. There 
is no way that I would be a religious trauma therapist if I didn't think that it was possible to heal from some of these things. And last week on the atheist experience, when SR quoted a very specific Bible hymn, even though he only mentioned like two lines of dialogue from that hymn, I heard it in my mind for like the next hour of my car ride. I know that there are people listening right now who would get so mad at me if I were just start to say, our God is an awesome God, because that thought is now going to be rattling around in the back of their brain for the rest of the afternoon, perhaps. And that can suck. That can be really painful. But it doesn't say to me that it's impossible to heal or to move on, just that these thoughts that we have carried with us for a very long time are going to be with us for a very long time. And we can still work to change them, to reduce them, to focus on other things, to change the way that we relate to them, to not be so bothered by them or to have so much distress because of them. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. That's uh, really reassuring because uh, in your case, it's the first that kept on ringing in your head uh, even after you, you got home from it. Like, um, in my case, it's not just the verses, but also like the bigotry and all the other stuff. Because, uh, you know, yeah. I, I'm trans, right? And, yeah. and you know, I have this part of me telling me that I am wrong and all my worldview is wrong. And, you know, the worst part about the whole thing is that I, I put in some effort in changing myself. But at the same time, the people around me are not conducive to that effort. They always give me the weird looks. Like just yesterday, I get invited to this dinner with my colleagues. And they, the first thing that they asked me was, hey, what's your religion? Right? And I said, well, I'm mm -hmm. not particularly religious. And they all just gave me that weird look. And this has happened to me multiple times in the past. This was not the only occurrence. And um, I guess that's part of the reason why I'm feeling hopeless most times about changing because the environment, you know, not just myself, it's also the environment. And um, I don't know, I guess I would like to have an advice to that because, you know, do keep in mind that I don't live in a deaf blood, first world nation, first world Western democracy where the separation on the state and the church is that clear. Here is more intertwined. And so the people believes reflect that. And we still have like um, uh, school at prayers. We still have a requirement for people to profess a faith in God in order to be eligible for public office. And um, yeah, uh, is that like, uh, uh, like <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> yeah. No, I, I hear it. I hear how challenging all of this is. You know, I, I used music because it's something of a softer thing for us to really talk about in an open forum here. But some of the bigotry, some of the misogyny, all of these really damning and harmful beliefs, the internalized homophobia, so many of these things are a lot harder to shake and I guess I want to say that there's good news and bad news here, and they're both the same thing, which is that all of us, whether we are born into a faith tradition or into an oppressive culture or whatever else, we all deal with some amount of magical thinking, of irrationality, and yeah, of bigotry and prejudice. And it's not a fair share. Certainly, there are circumstances and situations that are a lot harder and more difficult to heal from and move on from than others. And certainly, your situation sounds really painful and powerful and dire. But the truth is, we all of us are on some level working to grow and heal and deconstruct from some of these notions. Some of us are working harder than others. Some of us have more work to do than others. But there's nothing impossible about the place that you find yourself, and there's nothing broken about the person that you are because you've had these experiences. You are a human struggling to grow and heal and thrive just like everybody else. And I hope that you can appreciate that you're not alone in this journey, and there are a lot of resources and things that can be helpful, even if you find yourself remarkably isolated and struggling with a really oppressive circumstance and situation. Yeah, well, I'd like to thank you for giving me the hope. And I do agree that the uh, resources provided by the 
yeah by the ACA, the community, uh, it's been really uh, helpful for me to not only to deconvert, but to tell myself that there is indeed people like me out there and I'm not alone. Uh, and mm. I'm not, you know, the alien people make me feel like, like, you know, like I said about people around me giving me weird looks wherever I go, wherever I tell them that I'm not religious. So, yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate uh this the show being hosted yeah hey thank you so much and the very best of luck to you it makes sense to get discouraged and i hope that whether that community is online or wherever else that you aren't feeling like you have to go through all of this alone we appreciate your call hope you have a great rest of your day Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Richard, anything that you want to add there at the end? Um, yeah, I think I, I was and I always enjoy listening to you talk uh, when it comes down to kind of your area and uh, the advice that you give to people. I've I've never been religious, I've never deconverted, so it it's it it's great to hear those conversations had and just to sit back and listen. And mm-hmm. and I think that's a vital skill that a lot of people um, could could benefit from learning just listening sometimes. And you know, it's and I enjoyed I enjoyed just listening to that. Um, and my my only advice on that to anybody in that situation and anybody in any situation who feels like they're in in a kind of hard situation is remember self care first and foremost. Sure. Yeah, that basic hierarchy of needs. There are great resources for helping to break free of some of these ideas, for helping to like heal and recover after some of these ideas. But all of that kind of high minded effort really does start with making sure that you are showering and shaving and eating and sleeping and shitting and taking care of like the fundamentals of being a human being. And uh, I think that we so often forget that just caring for our bodies is part of that deconstruction, part of that healing process. So we do have a a few more callers on the line. Richard, I'm going to let you pick the next one as soon as I read through our top five patrons uh, who this week are in the number one spot, Dingleberry Jackson. Number two, Oops All Singularity. Number three, moving in is Dark Wolfie Games. Number four, Devor Valjean, and at five, Calvetti Helvetti, with our honorable mention, number six, Bethany P. Thank you to everyone for contributing. Uh, anybody who is interested in having their name read next week can still get it in. Uh, you can find us on Patreon at tiny.cc slash Patreon TH. And uh, with that, Richard, who do you want to talk to next? Let's, let's go for... Uh... Let's uh, let's go for Jason next. I think uh, I'll bring Jason in. Yeah, absolutely. Let's speak to Jason in California. Uh, what's on your mind today, Jason? Hey guys, uh, happy Bunny Day to you! Mm-hmm. And, uh, I just wanted to call. May all your bunnies be fi- chocolate filled and not hollow. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to call in for sixty seconds and give you guys a huge thank you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart. I'm driving along today and I realized, so, you know, for the last 40 years of my life, I would have been in an Easter service today, but, um, uh, you know, for, for, for a long time, uh, over 20 years, I was a pastor and, uh, uh, preached to thousands and, uh, did, did the whole, uh, church thing. And then through this show and, uh, just a lot, a lot of study have, have completely deconstructed. And so you guys are doing a great thing. You really, really are. And I just wanted to call in and just give my thanks and encouragement for what you're doing and uh, give you some love on the bunny day. (laughs) Hey, we (laughs) appreciate that so much. Uh, I guess I'll I'll echo what we had been saying, which is take good care of yourself today. You know, uh, for a lot of folks, these religious holidays does kind of stir up thoughts and feelings that maybe you thought had been handled or put to bed long ago. It is possible to heal. It's still possible to feel that kind of old war wound coming up on a day like today. So I'm so glad that you're spending part of it with us, Jason, and uh, taking good care of yourself. Yeah, I absolutely appreciate that. That's all you do. 
Yeah. Jason, I absolutely appreciate that. And I think it's very important as well just to just to put out there that certainly from my point of view, and we're all different, of course, here at the ACA, but from, from my personal point of view, I don't go out to kind of get people to change their religious views on anything. My my whole thing is just simply to get people to kind of think in a in a better way and assess things, uh, you know, using a better toolbox of stuff to assess the claims with and things like that and your beliefs with, because it's important. And you know, in the pre-show TikTok, uh, which we had, there there was a there was some talk. Someone mentioned kind of. Uh, this this idea that well religious people believe emotionally but it's very important and you know i mentioned earlier on ab about consciousness it's very important that we acknowledge that we all are led by emotion mm. it's not just the emotion isn't something we just put on religious people and we as skeptics or atheists are completely devoid of making all our decisions exceptionally rationally, just like the good Vulcans that we are. You know, that's that's not the way we operate. We all operate through emotions. And, and you know, we, we emotionally connect and we emotionally assess things. And this is how we view the world, kind of in some ways, first and foremost. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, you know, being in touch with your emotions and applying emotions to stuff. It, it's not a, it's not a dirty word. Uh, so it's it's not for me. It's not a case of trying to kind of come out and say your religion is wrong. You must deconvert Im immediately. You're just emotionally attached to it and devoid of any critical thinking, because that's just not the case at all. And uh, you know, I appreciate everybody who puts the effort in, like you have, Jason, uh, to really accept wherever it leads people. Uh, you know, put the effort in. And as you know, I've just been talking about, you know, deep listening, you know, listen, assess things, go out and do your own reading from good sources, vital that bit, because you can do your research in a flat earth way, which nobody wants to, <laughs> you know, that's not necessarily a good source, you know, go out and, and find good legitimate sources and, you know, and do that research and you'll be led to wherever you're led to. But the important part is that you're actually applying that toolbox. Absolutely. And, and I agree with you. I think emotions are a beautiful, amazing human thing that are to be completely cherished. But however, they can cloud. And for me, when it was a time to, to really start asking the, the, the tough questions, I had to kind of shed some of that emotion and allow myself to really look at fact. And it's, it's that step that led to where I'm at today and extremely grateful for grappling with some of the really tough questions that at the end of the day, I just simply didn't have an answer for. And, uh, and so that's, that's where I think it's okay to lay aside emotion at some time, but you're right. It is the elixir of life. <laughs> yep. Well, have a great rest of your Sunday. Take good care of yourself. And uh, we appreciate you so much taking the time to, uh, to just offer that support. Absolutely. Thanks, gents. Mm -hmm. Anytime. Thank you for calling. I, I wanted to get that one in because I thought it was going to be a nice, quick caller. And I know who doesn't want to be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if someone's going to call and tell us how yeah. much they appreciate us, I'm all for that. <laughs> uh, Dark Wolfie Games, uh, uh, it seems like there's a, there's a bit of a competition going off between Miranda and Dark Wolfie Games. Dark Wolfie Games is get stuck us with another super chat uh if i can find it it is somewhere uh, for ten dollars saying happy trans remembrance day to my sweet and stupendous seven i'm not quite sure what that reference is to but we appreciate the super chat nevertheless all right well we've got uh, a few more calls i think we're gonna take care of here in just a moment i want to make sure everybody knows that next week in honor of the eclipse all of our live shows are going to be broadcast from the free thought library in austin texas uh on february 5th we're doing truth wanted in the studio on the 7th on sunday we've got talk heathen and atheist experience I will be there. It will be a great time. Uh, so if you're able to make it, make sure to stop by for one or more of those shows. Uh, and I also want to make sure that people know that they 
that we want to hear from you, that we want you to be a part of our community, that you can participate with the organization of the ACA beyond Talk Heathen, beyond all of the shows that we publish. Uh, and you can do that starting at www.atheist-community.org. You can also reach uh, Richard and I to disagree with anything that we've spoken about or learn more about the ACA by sending us an email at tv at atheist-community.org. You can continue with these super chats and this ongoing super chat war we're watching uh, move through. But for now, let's talk to uh, Bill in California. Bill, what you got for well, us? Well, hello there. Howdy. Well, um, I basically, um, shall we say, I started out early in life as a Christian. Um, and. Um, I uh, was born into a Southern Baptist family. Some people will say, oh, I was born Southern Baptist. And it's like, no, you're not. You were, you were born, actually all of us are born in atheists. But um, so I was raised in Southern Baptist. And um, in, oh, well, I guess I started drifting away because um, I was married to a lady who, um, had rheumatoid arthritis and of course all the prayers that were offered to her and for her um, nothing ever happened uh, she just kept getting worse yeah so um, I that. and I mean I was I was really practicing Southern Baptist back in uh, this was back in like 81 82 and uh, my wife would, had been diagnosed with uh, rheumatoid arthritis in 77. And uh, she had four joint replacements. And basically the long and short of it is, uh, you know, of course, prayer never worked. Sure. Uh, so I came up with a saying, nothing fails like prayer. And uh, then I started really looking into things and uh, in uh, 1995, in uh, I think it was July, um, I joined the Libertarian Party and uh, realized at that time that we all need freedom and liberty and basically this country was founded for that. And then I also looked into the history of our forefathers and our forefathers were either deists or atheists. Um, Thomas Paine was definitely an atheist. And uh, so, you know, if you look at how the country was founded, and then if you look at the ninth article, and I call it that way instead of the Second Amendment, because in the uh, preamble, to the Bill of Rights, it says these 10 articles have to be added. So that made the first 10 amendments articles. So uh, they cannot be repealed. Anyhow. Yeah, so, uh, so to sort of make sure I'm following you, you had this experience where you watched and witnessed your wife suffering despite all of the commitment, all of the loving prayers and everything else that were offered, began to ask some questions, began to realize that there is sort of a mythology around Christianity in this nation that is not entirely accurate. And as you started to scratch the surface on that, came to some new ideas is there anything that you might offer to people listening today? Anything about your journey or your experience that you think might be well, yeah, valuable for somebody else who's having questions about the nature of reality? Of course, of course. I mean to interrupt you there. Um, basically, my uh, jaunt into atheism, shall we say, uh, started it after I joined the Libertarian Party in 95 because Jim Lewis, the gentleman who was the... Uh, personnel director of the uh, Libertarian Party in Connecticut, because that's where I was at at the time, uh, really got me into um, libertarianism and into the history of this country and into uh, the history of religion, actually. And um, 
the last words that man had ever said to me was, remember this, Bill, politicians and priests, two vultures hatched from the same egg. And that might be a slap on the vultures. Um, but uh, uh, after, unfortunately, he died two days after that. And uh, he had a, a library of, of over 2,000 books. And I happened to go through a little bit of his library after he died because uh, he was in my house. And I, uh, there was a book that he had called Atheism, The Case Against God by George Smith. I read that, and there was no turning back after that. And um, I, then I actually read the Bible um, cover to cover. Um, all I did was read it. I didn't study it, so I don't remember you know, everything that's in there, but I do remember some things. And, uh, I mean, there's so much inhumanity in the Bible. I don't know how anyone could follow that God. Um, and, uh, and then after reading all of that, I actually talked to my mother and my mother, she, she says, uh, of all my kids, um, you are the smartest. So I thought, uh, you would be the one to maintain the faith. And, and I thought to myself, I didn't tell this to her, mind you, but I thought to myself, mom, if I'm the smartest and I'm the easiest, what does that tell you? So <laughs> that was back in 2000. And, yeah, I, um, I appreciate that you, you know, were able to kind of release yourself from some of these problematic beliefs and that you were able to sort for yourself what is a, I guess, more rational view on the world. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Is there uh, anything you're, you're else, any, any sort of last thoughts that you would like to leave with our audience today? Anything that you want to make sure that the well, world knows about your experience? Well, my last thoughts, uh, I'm currently living in a, um, a veteran uh, housing project that was built hmm. specifically for veterans. And there are there's 48 apartments for veterans and so on and so forth. And what I'm, what I find is that the Christians in here who are Christian, they basically are more, uh, against, shall we say, uh, the atheist people and so on and so forth. I've got one gentleman that, um, he was my friend for quite a while until I found out I was atheist. And, uh, you know, I mean, this, this guy here, he's, really a, a grumpy old man. He's, he's, uh, 77 years old. And, and I mean, he's, he supposedly is a Christian, but he does not act like Jesus at all. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that going around. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, people that are Christian actually need to read about their supposed savior and start acting like him. Sure. Sure. You well, know, except, except of course, for the time that, that that he cursed the fig tree for not being in right. season. Sure. Yeah, uh, we've been <laughs> finding all kinds of exceptions here. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your story. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your holiday. Great rest of your Sunday. Uh, take care and thank great you so rest much. Of my Bill. Sunday, yeah, because <laughs> I, actually this is a pagan holiday, and the the reason that the Christians adopted it, of course, is because they wanted to attract the pagans into their um, uh, into their fold, so to speak. And they did the same thing with Christmas, and uh, because Christmas, the reason that. Um, Christmas is celebrated on December 25th is because uh, the pagans, they saw the northern pagans, they saw the sun stop moving um, south on December 21st, and then they felt that it, it started back up again on the 25th because of the way the stars are aligned. And... Um, so that was, of course, the birth of the sun, S-U-N. And the Christians, all they did, they adopted the birth of the son of God, S-O-N. They just had to change one letter or so. Oh, yeah. You know? There's plenty to be said yeah. about the Catholic Church and Christianity writ large co-opting these different things. Uh, but I, I suppose I'll leave you with this. I hope however we choose to define today or whatever this holiday or non-holiday or whatever else means to us, that you are moving towards a place of uh, making the world a better place. Thank you so much for your time and for giving us a call. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, again, I just I thoroughly enjoyed listening to that conversation. Um, I think uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things I want to mention before. I think we're going to go to a voicemail in a second, mm. but there's a couple of things I want to mention before that. The first one is there's been a couple of uh, theists in the chat disagreeing with us, as there is on, uh, on a weekly basis, who I've invited to call in and they haven't done. Please, please call in if you disagree with us. That's what we're here for. Uh, you know, preaching in the chat is not particularly helpful and it's not at all convincing. If you disagree with us, call in. You know, we're here to for talk that. to. <laughs> and, and secondly, uh, just on the fact that we're live from uh, the studio next week, I do want to point out uh, that the great, great Jason Friedman uh, will be joining Jamie the Blind Limey as host. I think it's his first time on Talk Heathen. Uh, if you're a, a non-profits fan, which you should be, uh, <laughs> you will know him from there. Uh, if not, go and check out Jason on the non-profits because he's a great, great guy, and I'm sure you will thoroughly enjoy the show next week with him hosting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to kind of big him up too much but he's, he's, he's a great musician and is a is also a mixed martial artist so if you're into that kind of stuff you know check him out next week he's a great great guy uh and on that let's go to the to the voicemail which i have not heard you don't have the holy spirit of jesus enough to protect you you've got it in your belly but that can be removed and will be removed if you take the army when Jesus says, I do not know you. It will be removed from you, and in that way, Jesus shall kill you when he removes that pearl of great wealth in your belt. That's the only part of you that Satan couldn't touch. The rest of your minds are even to now this day still corrupted more subtly but by that same voice that said in your thoughts, I would turn and toss you violently like a ball and don't tell the vision. So, no, you do not have a free thought. As a matter of fact, you know that I speak from Jesus. That's why you block me from speaking on your show, on your rail to the Omni. You might want to get you some matching white blue uh, berets when the Leviathan China comes knocking on your door. That way you can pretend you're a Buddhist. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, yeah, Richard, I'm not sure that there is much I can suss out uh, from all of that. I, I definitely heard Sophia try to sort through some of those ideas recently. Anything that you'd like to add here? Uh, I'm, I'm just bewildered. I, I, I heard a couple of things about Satan knocking on my door. Uh, you know, I, I have no problem with that uh, because it doesn't exist. So it's not a problem for me whatsoever. Uh, yeah. the, the the great Le Leviathan China coming knocking. Uh, uh, I've been uh, steeped in uh, Chinese history from my studies on Zen for many, many years. Uh, so I have no problem with that either. Uh, I know quite a lot of Chinese people, and uh, I have no problem with any of them. So if, if a great horde of Chinese come to my door, as long as they're going to bring food with them, I'm quite happy for that. That's all good on me. Fair enough. Yeah, uh, I I couldn't even imagine what else I would want to add. So. <laughs> uh, I suppose with that, uh, anything else that you'd like to touch on or, or bring up or make sure to share before we walk out the door for the day and wish yeah, people um, a, yeah. a happy chocolate bunny day? Uh, on, on this great chocolate bunny day, I think it's very, very important that, and you, you'll, the, the listeners are probably bored of me saying this, but I think it's very, very important for those of you who are believers, for those of you who are theists, especially in those traditions where you think that we should be saved and you need to convince us of the truth of something, uh, you know, don't preach. Don't preach in the chat. Don't preach in the comments because that is the least likely thing that you can possibly do to convince me that your religion is true. Uh, you know, if you come along with evidence or a compelling argument, uh, we would have no choice but to believe what you are saying. But you're not going to do that by shouting out phrases like Jesus loves you or you're going to go to hell when you die. That's not going to work. 
Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I might as well be listening to somebody shouting a giant octopus driving a bus is going to run you over tomorrow. You know, it it's, it's literally has that much effect on me. So if you, if you want to argue, if you want to have a conversation with us, if you want to, you know, there's lots of ways you can talk to us. If you want to have a friendly conversation, if you've never talked to atheists before and you're just curious about what we believe, you know, come and give us a call. Don't just preach in the chat because it's it's largely useless. Yeah, no, I, there are avenues for this, right? And honestly, what a sincerely wonderful opportunity if there is an all-powerful loving God that wishes to be known by us, that we are not just willing to take your call, not just willing to have a conversation with you, but are willing to do it in a format that is recorded, that is broadcast, like prove us wrong, embarrass us. We will not be able to like properly scrub that from the internet. There is this chance to show the entire world. Don't tell me that CNN wouldn't be calling if somebody really did have the opportunity or took advantage of the opportunity to prove the existence of God or magical octopuses or whatever else uh if you're unwilling to use that particular avenue ask yourself why ask yourself why you have to badger people in the chat who don't want to have that conversation despite the moderator's uh intervention and all of these things but you don't really feel like you can have a conversation about those things in a way that could potentially be seen by the whole world so some food for thought, some things to think about. And uh, I suppose other than that, I would like to, people to mull over this week the question, why didn't God ban slavery? Let us know your answers in the, uh, the uh, comments on this video. Uh, and then from there, if you are watching this show live on Easter Sunday uh, on 331.24, Richard and I are about to jump into the Atheist Community of Discord for a live after show. We'd love to talk with you further and continue these conversations. Otherwise, if you don't believe, this is your community. And we appreciate you being here. And if you do believe, we don't hate you. We're, We're just, just not, not convinced. convinced. <laughs> See you next time. We want the truth, so watch Truth Wanted live Friday at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTTW and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call TW.